But when you get through this place, it's just a reception room. You hang your hat up, you pull your car off in the lobby. Hello, I'm John J. Thompson, and on this episode of the True Tunes Podcast, we are offering a peek at one of our True Tunes live events, in this case, a recording of me and my friend visual artist Craig Yinkst, when we traveled to Cleveland, Tennessee, to speak at Reverend Finster's Rock and Revival, a festival and symposium in honor of the work and spirit of the late, great outsider folk artist, Reverend Howard Finster. Finster, who is considered by some as the father of modern folk art, worked his way onto most of our radar screens when his apocalyptically Christian and yet still childlike art was chosen to grace album covers for Talking Heads and R.E.M. Later, those of us who inhabited the alternative Christian music underground found one of his images on the debut album by the funky Southern California band Adam Again. We dove deep into A New World of Time on our episode that featured the Danielson family's Daniel Smith discussing this idea of outsider art, so if you're new to the show, go back and find that one for sure. I had gone down to Paradise Gardens on a road trip and just experiencing Paradise Gardens, walking the property, seeing these paintings, I felt like that was the beginning of God saying, I have some things I want you to do. I want you to stop just ignoring me. (laughs) Wow. You know, so that, so now that I'm thinking about it, that was that was really amazing. My first impression when I heard your music was this is the musical equivalent of outsider folk art, and that's what reminded me of Howard Finster, who I was such an enormous fan of. Yeah. But what's interesting to me also is that, as outsider as it might be, you still were very obvious about the spiritual aspects of what you were doing. I don't know if it was good or bad. I, I eventually took it as a compliment, but we were definitely, you know, too weird for the Christian culture, mainstream culture, and too Christian for the mainstream indie rock culture. But in between there, there were all these people that would come out to the shows. Did I step on your trumpet or did I lump, lump them? As you'll hear in this short presentation, I came to love Finster's art through his work with some of my favorite musicians. As the years have flowed by, however, this idea of outsider art has really impacted me as it relates to the relationship between creativity, commerce, and agenda, a triune tension that exists for creatives and consumers, whether we acknowledge it or not. Being invited to come speak at an event like this was a real honor. Then to have a visual artist like Craig Yankst, a true craftsman who has worked as both a painter and more recently as a woodcut printmaker was a treat. His work has graced several album covers and concert posters, including a couple of stunning new releases by Bill Maloney and Vigilantes of Love. He also designed the cover art for my new Wayside songs, which Michelle and I featured a few episodes back. So we'll take you today to an art museum in Cleveland, Tennessee, for a conversation about creativity, rule breaking, contextualizing outside art, and more. And along the same lines, we have loaded up the jukebox with songs from a singer, songwriter, author, and outsider who has been challenging and inspiring me for many years. John Darneal, who has been releasing indie music under the name The Mountain Goats since the early 90s, began his career putting out intentionally lo-fi and relentlessly imaginative music on cassettes. His style and subject matter are among the most diverse I have ever heard, and his narrative style is simply transcendent. It's so hard to get revenge The human element drags you down Lead a solitary life if you can Try not to show your face in town 
the breezes find such scandals as they may. Open up the variables, find a way, make it real, make a deal, until my protection comes. The Mountain Goats stand as a glowing example of outsider art in the pop and folk tradition and how successful it can actually be on a commercial level. It all happens right after we take care of a little bit of housekeeping. Can I, can I say something real quick? You may. Hey, this is Ray. And I'm a Patreon backer of the True Tunes podcast. I have also left a rating and review of the show at Apple Podcasts. It wasn't that hard. It didn't cost me anything. But this show means a lot to me, and I know that reviews and ratings make a big difference when it comes to how and if others discover these conversations. Would you take a few minutes, maybe even while you're listening, but please not while you're driving, to leave a rating and review? Even if you don't listen on Apple Podcasts, the reviews posted there push out to podcast platforms all around the world. Oh, and take some time to tell your friends about the show. Let's drive those numbers up together. Thanks. Hey there. I'm Mark Feldbush, and I'm a Patreon backer of the True Tunes podcast, and I follow and listen to the weekly Spotify Gallery Stage mixtape that John curates for us every week. I get to hear classic artists that I really dig and discover new artists. Every week, usually on Wednesdays, the mix is updated with around 40 songs from brand new releases to deep cuts and from across a wide range of genres including rock, Americana, indie, gospel, blues, sacred music, soul, and so much more. It's also great to hear a mix that blends up great music that is just good, beautiful, and true without all of the genre and market limitations and boxes I hear everywhere else. You can find the mix on the front page at truetunes.com or on the show notes page for this episode. And if you follow it, it will live there in your Spotify browser and update automatically each week. And don't miss the massive archive list where all previous lists get saved. And as great as Spotify is for music discovery, please support the artists you love once you hear and discover them there. Thanks. I want to thank Rob Alderman and all the folks at Lee University and the Museum and Cultural Center at Five Points in Cleveland, Tennessee, where we were surrounded by the work of the Reverend Howard Finster, less than an hour away from where he spent his life working, ministering, and dreaming. When I've done the True Tunes Live thing on the road, what I've really loved is being in California, being in the Midwest, being in uh, just being on the road, trying to find people in each place where, where we can actually make it a conversation. Because the podcast really is a conversation. Our show has been all about finding different conversations and then letting the conversation go. I honestly believe that a conversation is an art form in and of itself, you know, and we try to honor that. And then we, we do frame it and, and embellish it a little bit with music and production without hopefully ever stomping on the conversation. So the more I thought about this, I realized that my career and ministry and passion as an artist and as a communicator and as a person, all these streams all kind of flowed into one very weird path. And Finster was a part of that. I wouldn't say, you know, the dominant part of it, but was definitely one ingredient in that. And as I started to think 
about that, getting ready for this, it's amazing how significant that is. When you kind of stop and go, Mom, I didn't know you were putting cinnamon in the chili all these years. That's what that is, right? And so in a lot of ways, um, as I've gotten a little bit older and I'm going back and even thinking about the young me, the the 16-year-old John starting True Tunes as this kind of troubled, angsty, passionate, Jesus freak kid who's punky and outside of Chicago trying to turn everything on its head. I'm realizing that one of the spices in that gumbo was this concept of outsider art and that Finster was certainly not the only one doing that, but was definitely the one that came to me through rock and roll. Um, but I wanted to talk first about this idea of outsiders and the whole, the whole concept of outsider art. And I will cop right up front to the fact that I come at this I come at this conversation from a, a different, through a different door. I come into the mall through a different entrance, <laughs> right? My perspective on this comes through the lens of music. I'm not an art critic. I'm not a visual artist. I've dabbled in it. I like to make art. I thought I might be a painter one day, but really music was what got under my skin. And I first became aware of Finster's art through the artwork that he did for the Talking Heads and Adam again and R.E.M. But this idea of outsider art, folk art, definitely resonated with me from the time I was about 13 years old, 14 years old. And I see it, as I see everything, as uh, another way of understanding reality. So this isn't uh, an aesthetic thing for me. This isn't... um, uh, a decorative thing to me. This is an existential thing for me. And I'm just going to throw that out there up front. I am not an unbiased person when it comes to this. I'm not an objective critic when it comes to this. I don't approach this from an academic perspective. I'm a fully biased, completely unreliable witness uh, who comes at this as a fanboy, uh, as a practitioner, as an acolyte. And This idea of the stranger, the outcast, the outsider is to me really, really important for us to understand, I think, why this stuff is so important, why it resonates. I think there's a mystique to the idea of the person off in a cabin in the woods that's disconnected, doesn't have a TV. There's a certain uh, charm to that, um, but I think there's something more to that. I think personally, as a kid who this connected with, I will just testify and say the outsiders, especially what I would say the apocalyptic outsiders, the ones who were revealing something that was, all, that was happening and maybe in their world, the visionary, the, the, uh, the spiritual realm, or maybe it was a, poc- a personal apocalypse, as Mark Hurd referred to it. They were revealing something that was going on that was hidden. The apocalyptic outsiders were the ones actually telling the truth. Everything else was window dressing. It was lipstick on a pig. It was propaganda. It was decoration. It was something that wasn't going to get me anything I could actually hang my hat on and and was going to help me survive. As a troubled, traumatized teenager, 
it was this outsider art that was telling me that there was hope, that I wasn't alone. There's some really punk rock, kind of radical, scriptural ideas that I think provide kind of a roadmap for where Finster was coming from, for sure, and I think a lot of the Southern Gothic apocalyptic outsider artists. That idea is throughout scripture, and according to certain rabbis, it's either 23 or maybe 46, maybe 52, depending on how you interpret scripture. It's one of the most common instructions throughout scripture is how to treat the stranger, the outcast. If at the top of that you're also saying, well, why is that? It's because we're reminded throughout scripture that we are all strangers. We are all outsiders. We are all outcasts. And so the the resonance of this stuff is, I think, reminding us apocalyptically, pulling back that veil, that when we when we see this outsider art, we're actually, it's revealing that really deep down we are all, we are all outsiders. So art is either going to be telling us the truth, or it's going to be distracting us from the truth, or worse, selling us a lie. Uh, Leviticus 19 says, when a stranger dwells with you, do not, do not cheat him. Treat him like a natural citizen. Love him like yourself. John 17, 16 says, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. So even Jesus himself is saying, I'm a stranger and my disciples are, if you're of me, if you follow me, you are not of the world. He's creating a bond with all of the outsiders saying, we are not of this world. We're all outcasts. We're all outsiders and strangers. And this is just a small smattering of the overwhelming preponderance of scriptural evidence, which is what Finster was, he might not have been studied in school, book learning, they might say, but he knew his Bible. So the outsider artists, especially people like Finster, were just telling it like it is. This world is not our home. Now, that doesn't mean that because this world is not our home, we're supposed to trash it. <laughs> we're supposed to cast it to the dustbin. Um, that's not at all also what Finster's visions were about. Um, he's honoring the earth. He's celebrating the beauty in it and in its creation. You think it's such a sad thing when you see a fallen king, then you find out they're only princes to begin with. And everybody has to choose whether they'll win or lose. Follow God or sing the blues and who they're going to sin with. What a mess the world is in. I wonder who began it. Don't ask me. I'm only visiting this land. I suspect that when when these alternative rock icons kind of find this stuff, they resonate with that. But you have to juxtapose these uber hip, cool, educated rock and roll people and how they're reacting to this very preachy folk art. While meanwhile, Christians making Christian music, they're not having that same kind of response to that stuff. And that, to me, gets down to this, the, the central importance of understanding this outsider status. And, and that has been something I have been borderline obsessed with. Because I feel like before I knew what a Venn diagram was, I'm sitting there in my bedroom floor, or, or I'm kind of like Richard Dreyfus with a pile of mashed potatoes going, this means something. There's, there's circles here overlapping. My punk rock friends, my alternative rock friends, and my Jesus freak friends... Like we're resonating in certain frequencies and at certain places those things kind of line up. But then in other places they diverge and they're totally apart. So I want to kind of rewind the tape a little bit and go back to the 60s. There was this thing called the Jesus Movement that happens and the the famous version of it, the well-documented, the filmed version uh, is early 70s, Southern California, Calvary Chapel. Uh, There's even a a movie that came out that I was in last year called The Jesus Music that kind of locates it there. My contention is by the time that part of the Jesus movement was happening, it was actually, you're looking at kind of the caboose of the train. The Jesus movement actually really starts happening in the late 50s and early 60s. It's when in the Catholic community around the world, people started jazz masses and folk masses, even before it was actually sanctioned. It was still not okay 
to celebrate the mass in your local language, you had to do it in Latin, right? So if you spoke English, didn't matter, mass was in Latin. Using contemporary music in church was still not sanctioned, but priests and youth pastors and nuns and monks were doing it anyway. So you've got Vatican II finally announcing in 1966 that it's okay to do the Mass in English. It's okay to have these folk Masses. That is huge, because by, ni- by the mid-60s now, folk Masses are published and records are coming out and millions of people around the world start to experience church in a language that they can understand. And also at the same time as the counterculture is gaining steam, you've got the Vietnam conflict, you've got environmental crises, you've got the civil rights struggle, and a lot of spiritual leaders, priests and nuns and monks, uh, not only in the Roman Catholic Church but in the Anglican Church and in all kinds of churches, they shared a lot of those same concerns. And so they marched in Washington. They marched and they demonstrated. And young people saw many of their spiritual leaders actually engaged in those struggles. They shared the struggle for a minute. And so by the time the early 70s happens, you see millions of young people who have been trying the counterculture 60s ethic of free love and drugs and all that stuff. And that road, it doesn't take long to get to the dead end there. You're not finding the answers you seek. All of a sudden, Jesus emerges a reimagined, repackaged, <laughs> re-envisioned Jesus as this long-haired, sandal-wearing, robe-wearing, countercultural, peacenik Jesus. That Jesus resonates with these counterculture kids in a huge way. And a handful of ministries around the world, instead of fighting contemporary music and instead of fighting this generation, they welcome them in. And in London, in Florida, in Milwaukee, in Northern California, in Southern California, this thing just explodes. And in Latin America, in Central America, South America, Africa, Europe. But in Southern California, they had great cameras and they got it on film. And a church called Calvary Chapel had uh, just an explosion. And Southern California was a taste-making part of the world, and there's some great music that came out of it. The church started to label. You get a record, uh, two couple records come out of that. A lot of bands flock there. And that's where this movement, this revolution starts, and the counterculture and this emerging sort of Jesus revolution kind of peaks. And, you, and it makes the cover of Time magazine, makes the cover of Newsweek, the Jesus revolution. The beginning, I was a little shy. Then I got to thinking it might not be a lie. Then came a feeling that set me straight in line. I felt the Holy Spirit that gave me a new life. If you will believe, then you will receive and be. Gift of love and love from above is real. If you will believe, then you will receive and be. The gift of love and love from above is real. Now, within a couple years, a Billy Graham crusade in Dallas happens. 250,000 kids show up at that thing. And some enterprising people go, Oh, I see a market. <laughs> and that's the birth of the Christian music industry. It's the end, I think, of the Jesus movement and the beginning of the modern evangelical apparatus, the birth of the megachurch era. Most of the biggest megachurch institutions have their seeds in that Jesus movement, but they become something very different. But in the early 70s, a divergence happens where this kind of naive, simple folk art of Jesus freaks, these kids playing this raw version of Jesus music, this outsider art version. There's a remnant of it that stays out there, but then this market emerges and an industry is born. And from that grows an alternate market. Instead of being countercultural, this now becomes a subculture. It's because it's really based more about creating products for the subculture. They're not really that concerned about creating art that will impact the whole world. In some cases, it's it's not even the artists that are thinking about that. They're not even engaged in that level. They're just surviving, making music. But the industry people know how, how expensive it is to market 
a band or a record to the whole world, but it's a lot more affordable to market it to a, a niche that's predisposed to like that kind of music. It would be the same thing if you were releasing a old school jazz record, you'd rather market it to jazz fans than to everybody because it costs a lot of money to market the record to everybody. So this bubble emerges of Christians listening to Christian music and that becomes an industry. And, and in that industry, you might be an outsider to the world, which becomes code for people that aren't Christians, but you're not an outsider to the other people in the bubble. <laughs> So this status of being an outsider, the status of being a stranger in a strange land, it kind of fades away. And a new theology sort of emerges out of this evangelical subculture. And by the late 70s and into the 80s, the Reagan era, you have a theology of conquest and colonialism in the name of evangelicalism. We're now, we're not strangers in a strange land. We're here to take over this land. another set of train tracks, the counterculture, the mainstream counterculture, has gone through its 60s heady phase, crashed and burned, the economy, Vietnam's over, you got the malaise of the 70s, you've got all that. You've got punk, and then coming out of punk, which punk was really kind of the raw musical version of folk art for teenagers with electric guitars and drum sets. You know, it's the Dadaist version of what can you do which you really want to piss off your parents and freak out old people? You just play Ramones songs. And what were the Ramones playing? They were playing Phil Spector songs from the 60s really loud and kind of through their noses. They were sneering at you. It was loud and brash. And then the Ramones take that. And the idea when you listen to the Ramones was as a fan, if you're listening to the Ramones, or if you're in England and you heard the Sex Pistols, which basically were channeling what the Ramones did, but putting their own blue-collar working class dissatisfaction to it about the Malays. And the punk aesthetic was all about participation. And if you could, you started a band. Even if you couldn't, you probably started a band. But even the participation got into how you dressed yourself, how you did your hair. Like the tribe went from the band on stage out into the crowd. It was a very tribal participatory thing. It wasn't just creating a product, marketing the product, consuming the product. It was much more communal, much more participatory. Very much like me looking at Finster's stuff going, I could do that. So at True Tunes, when I first opened up the store, I kept a piece of paper on the counter and I spent countless hours on the phone talking to people all over the world who were calling and I doodled. I wish I still had those things because I mean, my doodles had those tiny little intricate things. I would write down little things customers said, you know, and I would put down where that person was, and, you know, Viktov from Poland. And I would draw what I thought he looked like, <laughs> you know, and I would, I would draw a big snail and I would, I would, sometimes I was so bored because they made me open the store at, at nine or 10 in the morning, but we were all dealing with rock and roll kids. Nobody showed up at True Tunes the first few years until about four in the afternoon. So those first few hours, I was just bored out of my mind and I would just doodle on my pad and, and I'd get another one out and doodle. And I was looking at these album covers and getting ideas, sometimes just ripping them off. And sometimes I put little Bible verse. I made them, one thing for years I did was stick figures. I loved stick figures. I'd make little dancing stick figures. I'd make little construction worker stick figures. I'd look out the window at True Tunes at the people on the street and I'd make little stick figure versions of little dad driving his station wagon down the street and I'd make little stick figures. And it was, I was trying to filter through what I thought Finster was doing and what meaning he was getting from it, and I would do it in my own way. I made all my favorite bands. I had stick figure versions of all of my favorite bands <laughs> as, as stick figures. Because the idea that I could do it made me want to do it. And it also it incorporated it into the music that I was writing. There's this divergence, though, of making art to consume in the bubble or making art that you want other people to go, I could do that.
I really think that part of what people like Michael Stipe, people like like uh, David Byrne, they were responding, even though Finster was boldly, unapologetically proselytizing with his artwork, they didn't mind that. They sensed the sincerity of what he was trying to do. Meanwhile, Christian music was boldly proselytizing and they wanted nothing to do with it. What's the difference? Partly, I think it's the honesty about being an outsider and the fact that he's, he's revealing... I, I don't have, like, there's all these weird confessional things and Christian music and Christian art was putting, instead of saying we're outsiders, we're strangers in a strange land, we're scared, we're distant, um, and, and finding commonality with the fact that everybody, honestly, at the end of the day feels that way, a lot of Christian music was kind of marketing something. They were selling this idea that, oh, if you just get Jesus, you're going to get that good wife, you know, uh, you're going to get a successful career, you're going to have peace. Uh, you just need Jesus and you're going to have all, you know, you see it on the bumper stickers, you'd see it on the t-shirts. And Jesus and Christianity became an entryway into this bubble world that was not truthful. And, and some uh, millions of people went into the bubble world and then their marriages would fall apart just like everybody else's or at least half of everybody else's. And their kids would end up with the same problems. They're like, wait a second, I bought all the right stuff. You know, I listened to the right music. The mythology, the product didn't work. And now I think we're seeing the great reckoning of that. And so what we're, I hope, trying to do is say, well, there's still something beautiful about having that childlike faith. And, and there's something beautiful about apocalypse. There's something wonderful about love. There's something wonderful about love. There's something liberating. Death alone brings There's something funny about a lot of sad things There's something wonderful about love I think there's a three-pronged or a three-dimensional point of tension that exists for all creative people who are trying to do what they do professionally. If you imagine three posts with like rubber bands connecting those three posts, one is just pure artistic expression, just that impulse to make something beautiful or terrifying, whatever it is, but something just creative. And then one is the ability to sell that thing to make money. There's just the commerce pull. The third one, though, is agenda. That agenda post is what are you trying to accomplish with your art? Some people say nothing. I got no message. And I, maybe sometimes... But usually there's some kind of an agenda. There's something you're trying to communicate with. But if you were to imagine, like, on that agenda poll, there can be political ideas. It could be something purely propaganda. But not all propaganda is bad. And maybe it is, I want to I sell the idea that smoking is bad, right? Well, that would be an agenda-driven piece of art. Somebody else might say, I have no idea. I'm just trying to make something that looks nice kind of laying over this or hovering above it somewhere, there's this idea of the difference between maybe art, like really communicative, intentional art, and decoration. There's nothing wrong with decoration. Decoration as I think, a, a holy, very important part of what it means to be a human being. We decorate the spaces that we're in. We, I think we decorate them intentionally. I think the way we decorate our space says something about our values and our tribe. And, our, and we decorate our space with art, but if we're not careful, we sometimes conflate art and decoration as if they're the same thing. So now we can go look at the Mona Lisa in person. We could look at a Matisse, a Rembrandt, a Van Gogh. We can, we can say, now this is art. But we could take the same Starry Night by Van Gogh and we can put it on a coffee mug. Is it still art? Well, the, it is art, but it's also decorating a, a coffee mug. Like this is now the... Art has gone on the continuum a little over to the commerce thing. And maybe Van Gogh was actually had a message he was trying to deliver about mental health and, and the church that's dark and the, and the painting, everything else is light and he's painting it from his view in the asylum. And why is the church the only building there that doesn't have the lights on? And 
now we're getting into the, like, he has a message he's trying to deliver. We're oblivious to his message in Starry Night. We know a beautiful Don McLean song. And if you know Bill Maloney, you're thinking about that Bill Maloney song where he's like, you sew your heart onto your sleeve and wait for the ax to fall. And Vincent, he picked up the blade and he put it to his ear. You might be thinking about that when you look at Starry Night. And now you're going into this expressive thing and you're feeling some of the message of Vincent. You might be drinking your coffee and going, that's pretty. You there with the paint box. You there with paper pen. Me, I've got this blood instrument. I'm gonna play on till the end. And you know you come with empty hands. But you don't come at all. The package comes wrapped up There is a lesson here Vincent, he picked up the blade And he put it to his ear Now look, if you're gonna come around here And say those sort of things You gotta take a few on the chin Art can become mere decoration. Same thing with music. Bill wrote a beautiful song based on a beautiful painting, and we can sit and listen to it really intensely, or it can be playing in the background at our Christmas party, right? And it becomes decoration. I could take a beautiful painting and I could turn it into wallpaper, and it could become decoration. So there's always this kind of three-pronged bit of tension between creativity and commerce, between creativity and propaganda. Often there's not as much com tension between propaganda and commerce, but there can be. We need to be raising up a generation of creative people that are at least aware of those points of tension so that they can be mindful as they're working. And then as we commercialize things, as we sell things, as we market things, as we talk about things, are we aware of where and how we are moving along those points of tension? So with with Finster even, we have someone who's like, his way of judging whether something was successful or not has almost nothing to do with, I have no evidence that he cared a lick about what something sold for. When he says, oh, I put 23 verses on that Talking Heads cover and they sold a million copies in a month, that's 23 million Bible verses that went out there. That's how he judged it. Now, does that mean much? For me, I want to sit like I did as a kid and just gaze at these things and go, what, is he, what does this mean? And even some of them to go, well, that's kind of crazy. And it's okay for somebody to be crazy. It's okay for somebody to be wrong. But it's also kind of interesting, and in a sad way, how these two records represent, <laughs> this is the Talking Heads album cover, and this is the Adam Again and A New World of Time album cover. <laughs> How when Adam again, who were big fans of this album and of R.E.M., how they talked to Howard and they said, hey, we would love to have a painting for our album. And he loved them and said, I would love to. And he sends them a painting that looks almost identical. Now, this ends up basically reinforcing the idea that Christian art is just a knockoff of mainstream art, which when you listen to this, it's not. This is this is a, a. It's their first record. They got a lot better, but this is a great, unique record. But it is kind of an unfortunate coincidence or happenstance that that reinforces visually that what a lot of these guys thought about quote unquote Christian music.
We're going to step away from this True Tunes Live event at Reverend Finster's Rock and Revival Festival for just a few minutes. There's more to come with this conversation about outsider art and music when we crank up the True Tunes jukebox to check out another example of a singer, songwriter, and novelist who has found great success far outside of the mainstream right after we take care of a little bit of housekeeping. Hello, I'm Chris, and I'm a Patreon supporter of the True Tunes podcast, which has quickly become one of my favorite podcasts. I can always expect John's warm voice and insightful questions to draw out the stories, wisdom, and faith of beloved and new to me musical artists. After every episode, I'm always listening with fresh ears to favorite albums or visiting new albums for the first time. It's just like when I used to visit the old True Tunes store in Wheaton, Illinois, But now I can visit every week with new episodes. True Tunes Patreon supporters support the show with monthly donations of $5, $10, or $20, which helps cover the cost of producing and hosting the show. As a thanks for our support, we get early access to episodes and high-quality, lossless WAV files of each episode that we can download. We also have occasional Zoom meetups, some special live streams, discounts on True Tunes swag, and more. You can join me and the other patrons by visiting patreon.com slash truetunes or finding the link on the show notes page. If an ongoing patronage thing is not the right fit for you, but you'd like to give us a tip to help with the costs associated with this show, you can find links for that on the show notes page. Thanks and enjoy. Hello, my name's Rob and I'm one of the Patreon backers of the True Tunes podcast. I'm honored to invite you to join me in support of True Tunes by signing up on their email list. I know email is often annoying, but by being on the list, I get notified when new episodes drop and when new articles get posted at truetunes.com. Sometimes, John even sends out short notes and gives away records and swag and stuff. Super cool. But really, the point is that by staying directly connected, I know that they don't have to pay Facebook or anyone else in order for me to hear from them, and that's important. They don't send out too many emails either, and I'm always happy to get them. So really, it would be helpful if you'd join me over here. You can find the sign-up link on the front page at truetunes.com. Oh, and don't forget to add John's email address, jjt at truetunes.com to your contacts so that the emails don't get caught in your spam filter. And if you have any feedback on the show or questions, you can email him and he'll get back to you eventually. Thanks for listening. I'm warning you right up front, there is no way we can fully do justice to John Darneal's still thriving output with the Mountain Goats on one jukebox feature. Instead, consider this a primer, an introduction to the uninitiated. Besides, we hope to have Darneal as a guest on the show someday, so we have to keep some of our powder dry. The good news is, though, that thanks to websites like the Annotated Mountain Goats, podcasts like I Only Listen to the Mountain Goats, streaming services like Spotify, Apple, and YouTube, if you want to hear more about this guy and his music, his perspectives, his ideas, you definitely can. So, with all of that in mind, let me drop this poker chip into the slot here and see what happens. John Darneal started writing and recording music as the Mountain Goats in the early 90s. Though he is the only constant member, 
and the project truly is an extension of his songs and his creative vision, he has been assisted by various friends and collaborators since the beginning. Originally formed in 1991 in California and currently based in Durham, North Carolina, the Mountain Goats have included members of an all-female reggae group redubbed the Bright Mountain Choir and members of Super Chunk, Bob Mould's band, and others. But despite the massive talent and significant contributions of his collaborators, Darneal's singular vision always shines through uncompromised. I know you see Mars in the sky tonight. I know you can see Venus rising and veering off to the right. Can you see that young star overhead? It's the one that designed my undoing. I know that in California the waves break on the beach And I know that the foam on the breaking waves is as white as household bleach But do you see that particular white right now? It's the color of the young star coming on down I got joy, joy, joy in my soul tonight I got joy, joy, joy in my arms all right all the Treat me badly. I love you madly. You really got a hold on. For the first five or six years, the Mountain Goat songs were recorded by Darneal at home on a cassette boombox. It was intentionally lo fi, leaning into the limitations instead of trying to overcome them. I have to admit, when I first heard the Mountain Goats back then, I did not fully appreciate that aesthetic approach. My band, and all my friends' groups, were striving to take advantage of the early days of digital recording. We were trying to make professional-sounding records that we could actually afford. We were thinking about drum sounds and amps and this new thing called automated mixing, while Darneal, on the other hand, was cranking out dozens and dozens of songs on his boombox. From the entrance to the exit Longer than it looks from where we stand I want to say I'm sorry For stuff I haven't done yet Things will shortly get completely out of hand I can feel it in the rotten air tonight In the tips of my fingers In the skin on my face In the weak last gasp of the evening's dying light In the way those eyes I've always loved Illuminate this place like a trash can fire In a prison cell Like the searchlights In the parking lots of hell I will walk down to the end With you, if you will come All the way down with me While I was blaming my lack of output on things like distribution and recording budgets, the Mountain Goats were busy composing, recording, and releasing their first couple hundred songs, tackling issues like immigration, addiction, aliens, religion, wrestling, football, the Roman Empire, mythology, and more. Darneal, who had overcome a serious drug addiction and was earning a college degree in English during the first few years of the band, was workshopping his creative worldview and developing his aesthetic voice. He was writing songs the way most guitarists practice their scales. He was sharpening his observational and compositional skills and would worry about stuff like drum sounds later. For Darneal, it seems the concept of fidelity was critical, but he was much more concerned with the truth of his stories than he was about the signal-to-noise ratio on his tapes. Lands opening up like a blanket The dandelions spread themselves thickly out which are evidently endless We are hotly in love with one another We've got an unquenchable thirst in our throat We are for some reason all the time pleading And we are friendless And we love these dogs that roll on the lawns here in Galesburg Because they seem to know something nobody else knows It is written in the smiles on their faces And it rings in their high young voices We are burning up all of our choices Up here where the tall grass grows As 
the 90s wore on, the Mountain Goats became a bit more sophisticated and earned wider acceptance in the indie rock world. But things really shifted in the new millennium, with the release of All Hail West Texas and Tallahassee. Although sonically these albums showed a return to the band's lo-fi roots, the conceptual integrity and lyrical acumen represented a sort of watershed moment in Darnell's ability to craft a long-form observational story. It was clear that even if the sonics sounded casual, the work was incredibly intentional and disciplined. By diving deeper into the perspectives of characters planted in Texas and Florida, Darnell expanded his palette and demonstrated the seriousness with which he approached his art. Take, for example, the opening song, The Best Ever Death Metal Band in Denton, a song that manages to be funny, touching, thought-provoking, and surprisingly spiritual. The best ever death metal band out of Denton was a couple of guys who'd been friends since grade school. One was named Cyrus, the other was Jeff, and they practiced twice a week in Jeff's bedroom. The best ever death metal band out of Denton never settled on a name. But the top three contenders, after weeks of debate, were Satan's Fingers and the Killers and the Hospital Bombers. Although a certain lo-fi spirit remained, subsequent albums saw increasingly sophisticated instrumentation and arrangements. 2004's We Shall All Be Healed offered a rare autobiographical perspective. As Darnell set aside his third-person character sketches and talked more openly about his previous struggles with addiction and how his strongly held Christian faith was informing his recovery. This morning I went down to the Catholic Church Something just came over me Forty-five minutes in the pews Praying the rosary when the last day has come We shall see visions More vivid than sunsets Brighter than stars We will recognize each other See ourselves for the first time The way The way we really are The album also ushered in a new season of collaboration with producer John Vanderslice, an indie artist in the San Francisco area who specialized in analog recording. The two would team up again later for another autobiographical album, The Sunset Tree, that dealt with the abuse Darnell experienced as a child at the hands of his stepfather. My sister called at 3 a.m. Just last December. told me how you died at last, at last And that morning at the racetrack was one thing I remember I turned it over in my mind Like a living Chinese finger trap Seaweed in Indiana, sawgrass, pale green thing Interestingly, despite frequently talking about his faith and even mentioning that his favorite pop artists were Amy Grant and Rich Mullins, the Mountain Goats remained firmly ensconced in the mainstream music scene, utterly ignored by the Christian music world and increasingly respected and embraced by the very elements of Indian alternative music that many religious folks assume are completely closed off to any mention of faith or the gospel. In 2009, the Mountain Goats, again with the help of Vanderslice, released The Life of the World to Come, a collection of 12 songs based on and named after Bible verses. It was not nominated for a Dove Award. My prayer goes unanswered, that's all right. If my path fills with darkness and there is no sign of light, Let me praise you for the good times 
Let me hold your banner high Until the hills are flattened And the rivers all run dry And I won't get better But someday I'll be free Cause I am not this body That imprisons me For the last dozen years or more, the Mountain Goats have embraced both studio and live recording. The studio albums have become increasingly polished, including 2020's Getting Into Knives, 21's Dark In Here, and 22's Blistering, Hilarious, and Typically Brilliant Bleed Out, a collection of songs inspired by 80s action movies. Along the way, the band continued to record and release the Jordan Lake Sessions, a series of live takes that started during the pandemic and show no sign of stopping. You're gonna send me back to where I came from. Please don't send me back to where I came from. Let me go. Where the white magnolia is. You're gonna fit me for that orange jumpsuit. Please don't fit me for that orange jumpsuit Let me ride Where the dragonflies ride Yeah, I bet you're going to do What you want to do No matter what I ask of you You think you hold Darnell has also been spotted collaborating with filmmaker Ryan Johnson, composing music for, and briefly appearing in, the director's new TV series, Poker Face. He is fantastic in it, by the way. Two, three, and... Merch girl, working all night. Merch girl, fits me just right. Merch girl, last one to leave. Merch girl, nothing up her sleeve. Yeah! I'm gonna buy a new guitar, neck and leg with pearl, to pay my passage to the underworld. I'm gonna crawl up from the afterbirth and wander lonely on this earth Satan cast your evil spell save a place for us in hell you must learn we're all gonna burn because you can't unmurder someone we electrocuted a lamb for the keys to the kingdom Now it's time to burn Cut 
clear me a space on the hallway closet floor lie to the cops when they're at your door throw crumbs get the hounds off my tail Make sure the coast is clear Before you get my mail Harbor me When I'm hungry There's so much to discover once you jump down the mountain goat's rabbit hole. And if somehow you manage to listen to all of the music and want more, don't forget that John Darnielle is now an award-winning novelist as well. It's almost not fair. We'll link to all three of his novels and an incredible short story treatment of a troubled young man demanding that the staff at the mental hospital to which he has been sentenced return his Black Sabbath tape and Walkman to him, which was published as part of the 33 and a Third series. That little book blew my mind. Darniel is so smart, so passionate, and has so much empathy for the characters he inhabits that I find myself in awe of the gifts he stewards. And though he certainly has honed his skills literarily, compositionally, instrumentally, and even vocally, there remains a critical outsider nature to his work. He may be a professional now, but he is still out here with us, the broken, the normal people the seekers, and the confused. His work creates resonance, wonder, humor, and fellowship. In the end, for me at least, it sparks hope, too. It's dark as a coal mine Filling up with gas jukebox is making that rattling sound again i think we'll let her cool down and continue our hope that someday we can coax darneal to join this conversation in person in the meantime check out the show notes page for links to lots of different darneal resources and a special spotify mix that i have pulled together to get you started Right now, let's get back to Cleveland, Tennessee, to the Cultural Center and Museum at Five Points, and my conversation with Craig Yinkst at Reverend Finster's Rock and Revival Festival. First of all, would you? What do you think about this this concept of outsider art, and my, even my definition of how I've talked about it, like set me straight or? pushback outsider folk art whatever like your practitioner would you how do you think about these terms yeah i think uh 
that whole outsider aspect hits something that's very guttural. Something in a good way or a bad way? In a way? good way. Okay. It's very honest. It kind of strips away the layers or the facade. Uh, for me, with art, I kind of came in it through the back door because starting off it was more uh, renaissance and learning to manipulate the paint and the composition and create beauty in that manner and I was kind of at some point exposed to outsider art and your maybe your initial reaction was oh that's well that's not that good you know <laughs> right. but it's over time that you continue to look at it and it still kind of pulls at you and you see you see that there's a creativity in these people that are doing it that's just a driving creativity and i think that's the aspect of god in all of us is is to create in the beginning right. god created it's the first thing that we learn about god and we all have this driving need to create something mm -hmm. um something of our lives something with our hands something you know that's tangible and so I think that that pulled me back to that area. I, you know, you probably wouldn't look at my work and say, well, you know, he's an outsider Finster type of artist. You wouldn't really look at my work and see that. But I think there's something that constantly pulls me in that direction, wanting to be more and more honest with my own work, you know, mm -hmm. and strip away the facade or the... Uh, the kitsch of things and how, how can I make that more raw and honest? It seems like there's with with some of that folk or outsider art some of that naivete or that simplicity is because the drive to do it is more compelling than the compulsion to make it perfect so it's like it, it's a little bit more like i'm going to get this done and then move on to the next thing and i'm, I'm going to do the next thing because the vision is coming faster than my need to go back and make this thing pristine yeah, I think I'd agree with that. I, I don't know to what extent Howard stepped back from his work and, you know. <laughs> Critiqued it. Or yeah, yeah, I think I really need to change this area yeah. over here. I think, like I said, with a lot of outsider artists, they have all of this going on. It's that fine line between genius and insanity, you right, know. Right. And it's like, let me get this out of my head and get right. it out and get it out and get it out and get it out. So they, they're not there to... Oh, the aesthetic, the color. I like these, two, you know. And, and what I like about Howard, too, is he was always moving to something different. You know, they say, well, he started painting when he was 60. Yeah, but he'd been for 30 years, been a mixed media artist. You right. know, he'd been, he'd been doing art, just not painting. And so it was just a continuation. And then he would go to university or something and learn something of printmaking or this or that. And, he, well, I got to try that. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to do that. Well, I'm going to try that. And he, he just never held back on his um, discoveries or, you know, moving out into the world. And there's, there's so much more out here. That, that wonder, that sense of wonder. Right. And I think as an artist, that's key, that we don't lose that sense of wonder. I stand on a bridge before the cavern of night. Darkness alive with pots 
You've been doing this for a while, and I mean, I just, you actually had an installation at True Tunes, which I vividly remember, and one of your paintings in particular, I used to talk to, um, he had a painting that hung up in the club at True Tunes, we called it Upstairs at True Tunes, it was a, a venue where hundreds of bands played in that place, but my office was also up there, and so I spent thousands of hours by myself up there during what was to this point, probably the most difficult time of my life because uh, I was watching this whole thing that I built, which a lot of people loved, just get destroyed. And he had a painting on display up there of a guy laying in the gutter, like his head, like his head was deformed and he's laying in the street, like with his head. And, and it, it, I felt like that was me. Like I was about to have my head run over by a truck and I would go up in the morning and have my coffee and stand and, and talk to him <laughs> and say like, what are we gonna do today? Like, what, what's going on? And I don't know that he actually talked back to me, but I would wave at him when I left my office and we, we, had, we, were, we were pals um, and it looked like he was looking at me, you know, and he kind of had a strange expression on his face that at first I thought was abject misery and then later I felt a certain kind of kinship with but that was a very different style of art like now you do this very it's primitive but also very refined you are able to do what you do at a fine with with a finesse and a skill without losing authenticity without losing pathos passion integrity so how do you process that stuff and retain that kind of integrity in your work or is that something that is just it just happens, or is it something you have to think about? No, I think I think there's always that tension, and you know, just the fact that art can become a commercial product is can be detrimental. It's something I think you are always fighting against. You know, you want to be as true and honest. I don't go into the pop culture i'm not going to do justin bieber you know mm -hmm. i'm not going to i'm not going to sell myself out like that even though i do music and music related items uh they're they're it's more of a nostalgia i guess um for better or worse it's it's looking back at these things that i think had meaning or still have meaning that have become icons uh of our own culture you know, so like the Man in Black or Hank mm -hmm. Williams or the, these guys that kind of forged the way to uh, uh, to the new creativity or whatever. And so I, I'll do them, but it's also I'm looking at them and I'm trying to get their message out. At the same time, I'm probably trying to get my own message out. You know what right. I'm saying? So I'm filtering it through them. But yeah, the commercial aspect and. Um, making the making your own art again it's compromise is a is a bad word but if you're wanting to make a living at all in art there at some point there has to be some compromise i mean when i started trying to do my art full time i think i was working on a circus sideshow series and i was, sell, I was showing, trying to sell this stuff down in florida which probably, I guess, could have been all right. You know, there <laughs> the were, whole place is a there, circus there were, show. Yeah, but, but you got a ring, uh, the Barnum, Barnum down there in Sarasota, yeah. uh, or Ringling Brothers. Uh, but for whatever reason, this stuff just went flat. I mean, I, could not, I couldn't give it away. And um, here I got a family <laughs> that I'm trying to right. take care of, you know, and... and so you, you start looking at other interests, or I'm doing different interests, and it was kind of the, the music thing, the first thing that took off. I, I had this booth with all this Circus Sideshow magic stuff, and I think I had maybe two or three of the music things at the time, and that was all I was selling. It was mm. crazy. So to some degree, better or worse, it forced me into doing this. Now, do I need to stick with it? I mean, I'm in a position where 
I can do anything out there. It's, I, don't, I don't need to do this. I don't need to look for a commercial outlet for my work. I don't need to pick up a, a gallery. I'm doing fine. So I have this freedom now to pursue my interest as much as I want. Some of them are still in music, you know, music-related art. Uh, a lot of it's in the sacred art. I've been working on a whole series on Celtic, uh, some of the Celtic saints as of late. I like the story. things. I like to explore into these different areas. And so I'll do them, and I'm putting them out, and it's like no one's buying this stuff. No one's buying this stuff. And, and I just say, okay, who cares? You know? <laughs> right. It's what's my next one, yeah. you know? Yeah. And here he is again. Here's another one. Don't buy it. <laughs> Here's another one. Don't buy it. You know, but I love it, and, yeah. and it's, I'm gradually building this whole series of these things. I have enough of a body of work where stuff still trickles in. I'm, I'm represented by about five or six galleries. For those of us who are in the music space, music itself doesn't sell like it used to, but music adjacent products are important. So if it's like this, I brought this out here. This is the Vigilantes of Love Killing Floor. This is a vinyl reissue of an album that came out 30 years ago. This is one way that a tragically obscure independent artist can actually make some money is find a few hundred devoted fans to kickstart a project and raise twenty or $30,000 and do a two record set with beautiful packaging. Um, and Craig did the art for this. I mean, you need to come up and look at this when we're done, but it is, it is gorgeous. Having somebody like you that can come alongside an artist like Bill Maloney and invest that kind of time in creating uh, art that goes along with this. Yeah. When did you first yeah. kind of think about doing music related art how did that come to you well you know ironically the piece you were talking about earlier uh which was lazarus and the rich man oh yeah my boy. it was a parable it was the parable of lazarus and the rich man him laying on the on the sidewalk the, the the poor man lazarus but that actually got on the ideology album that was That's the right. cover of ideology they probably saw it at in the store <laughs> <laughs> because they played there a lot and you know, I think I crossed paths with a lot of musicians over time. I did a couple for Ordained Fate, if you oh remember gosh. that group. Yeah. Um, and they had gone to our church. You know, we went to the same church there. Um, and then with Bill, you know, I'd just been a fan forever. And I, I remember doing a show up in North Carolina and saw that he was actually going to be playing a little bar <laughs> right across the street from where my tent was set up that night. And I... I had never met Bill, and but I was hoping to at some point. And sure enough, here he comes walking into my booth. And so I was able to talk to him then. And we ended up doing a trade. Um, you know, he was putting out all these little cassettes and things at the yeah. time and, and bootleg stuff. And so I ended up doing a trade for a big Hank Williams piece I had. And then we just got to know each other, and then eventually he just called me up and said, "Listen, I got this this project for you. Do you want it?" And you know, we went from there. Now I know I know the musicians have a difficult time, even more so now. Yeah. And I feel a part of a bigger scene, the body of Christ. Hmm. You know, it's not all about me. So I I feel that. If I do have a gifting, if you want to call it that, or a talent, it's not necessarily meant for me and myself. And and so, over time, I've had projects where, you know, I've done I've done a number of books, and all the proceeds will go, you know, will go to different um, charities and stuff. And it's not to toot my own horn. I'm just saying it's like this. You know, we, we all have different gifts, and, and we all do it in different ways. Like, listen, hey, I have a talent in work in plumbing. Let me, let me help you with that. Hey, listen, I have this. Let, let me help you with that. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, I'm doing, you know, Bill, I can do this for you and maybe help raise a little money in the, in the process. Let me help you with that. So um, I, I look at my, I guess I look at my vocation as more than just me, myself, and I yeah. on that. 
That's great. For me, I think the most common definitions I hear, again, there's going to be a spectrum. And uh, folk art or outsider art or whatever is going to be the less refined. It's not fine art. And the weird thing is going to be, as soon as you take a, a folk artist and you put them in a gallery, is it now fine art? I think that it's less trained it's higher volume, it's less sophisticated, uh, it's simpler materials. And I think the difference to me is going to a craft fair when you see someone that's basically found a way to do the same thing over and over and over and over again. And what they're making is a cool product that it's, it's nice and it's, it's cute, but it's really just a, a mass-produced, it's a hand-mass-produced craft. But if, you're, again, you're looking at that continuum between art and decoration it's probably more towards decoration when you're talking about real i think outsider art you're talking about that person is just compelled to make something and they're just doing it and you kind of know the difference when you see it if you see a lot of it you know so um when that when you talk about that applied to the music space it's it's similarly difficult to assess because there are artists tom waits you know, Tom Waits is one of those artists early on you'd go, that's an outsider artist. And then you realize he's kind of got a, na a lane. He's got a character he's created. He's, he's, he's personifying, he's almost acting a role of a character with the hat and the suit and the whole thing. And he's created a persona of an outsider. Now, is that really outsider art or is it high art? I think that the fun is to process and listen deeply and look and think and discuss and debate. And when I was a kid, we get the records, we put the record on, and we fight it out. And what it did was it created community, even the arguing, the debating, because the, the beauty of it is the, is the community that it creates, not the product itself. What's better is when we say, I want to do it. Like, I want to have the conversation. I want to go out and write that music. I want to play the songs together, you know? Um, so... I think this generation's really lost a lot because of Spotify, because of things that you can get instantly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I know when I was growing up, I, I would listen, you know, okay, the only place to hear it would be on the radio, and you might hear a song or two, and, and you'd like, boy, I want to get that. I want, I want to buy that album. And so it was this long buildup. I couldn't just get that. Right. Get that you immediately. Tape it off the radio. And, yeah, yeah <laughs> right. I can't get that immediately. So, yeah, you're either taping it or you're, you're. I'm saving. You know, I'm, I'm selling papers. I'm, I'm gradually getting enough money, and then you. It became in a whole experience. I would go to the, to the music store, and you'd be flipping through these albums, and then you might be down to two, and it would be a lot of times it would be the visuals that would push me just over the edge. Like, well, I like two songs on here. I like two songs on here. But man, this is this really this is pretty cool looking, and you'd finally plop down the money, and you go back to your, you know, your room, and you'd lay in the bed, and you take that thing off, and it was the visual, it was the poetry, it was the audio, it was the whole, you know, the whole the smell, experience. Even, yeah. yeah, it was I the remember, whole experience. I remember in the eighties, posters, when you, yeah, remember right. the interior oh, yeah. posters yeah. in there, yeah. but but I mean, and that's all lost now. It's instant gratification, right. you know. 
Well, thanks. I really appreciate <laughs> you, you taking some time to talk with us today. Yep. Right? yep. Thank you. It's time to get the lash. Time to get the rope. Sharpen the razor. Grab the microscope. Don't be pretty when they cut the tether. Sometimes you lose your address to find your shelter. Why is joy something I must steal? Starving skeletons are looking for a meal. Out in the graveyard, church bells peal. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can't heal. Heaven can't heal. Oh, oh. I bought a crab detector, emptied all my savings. It's got a hair trigger feel for the slightest provocation. There to spill blood or judge out a line. It's just a modern convenience to save you some time. Why is joy something I must steal? Starving skeleton looking for a meal. Out in the graveyard, church bells peal. Earth has no sorrow. Heaven can heal. Thank you, Craig, and thank you, everybody else there in Cleveland. It feels kind of like I've been up on my soapbox most of this show, so I'm not sure I need to add much here as we wrap up, other than to simply underscore that as we think about this idea of outsider art, maybe we need to get back to the fact that really, if we're being honest, aren't we all outsiders? It seems to me that the plot of this story we are living in is that there's a garden we're all trying to get back to. There's an ideal, a picture, a place that represents wholeness, healing, life, love. And if we feel deep down that we are outside of that place, and as Joni Mitchell wrote about Woodstock, we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. Any music or art or faith that seeks to distract us from that outsider status, to medicate it, or worse, to encourage us to get comfortable east of Eden, is a lie, isn't it? Maybe that's why it was always the needy, the sick, the blind, the outcasts, who were the first to recognize Jesus. The ones who had become comfortable in this world, who had established an empire here, were threatened by his kingdom of grace and love. Finster, Darniel, Yingst, Adam again, let's keep finding the stories, songs, and visual art that provoke us to hunger for that garden and then keep our eyes and hearts open for all of the ways we might make that kingdom come today, here, outside the garden's gates. Okay, I'm climbing off my soapbox. That's going to do it for this episode of the podcast. Thanks again to Rob Alderman and everyone in Cleveland, Tennessee. It's a great little town that I hope to revisit soon. And thanks to Craig Yinkst. You can find links to his work and a lot more on the show notes page at truetunes.com slash outsiders2. And if you would be interested in booking me to speak at your school, community center, church, or anything else, reach out through truetunes.com and let me know. Thanks, as always, to our Patreon backers. If you would like to join the group, head over to patreon.com slash truetunes. Or if you'd like to give us a one-time gift, you can find the PayPal link on the show notes page. And thank you for all of the other ways you help the show, leaving us the ratings and reviews at Apple Podcasts, subscribing to the weekly Spotify Gallery Stage Mixtape, and signing up on our email list. This podcast was written and produced by me, JJT, with co-production, editing, and sound design by Bruce A. Brown for Gyroscope Productions. Our theme song is a special instrumental mix of Full Circle by Phil Keggy and Rex Paul. The contents of this program are protected by U.S. copyright law and are the intellectual property of Gyroscope Productions, with the exception of songs or clips that are from previously copywritten materials. Everything on this episode is used by permission or under fair use provisions. Thoughts and opinions of our guests do not represent the positions of our producers or our sponsors. Discernment is recommended. This program is intended for the private use of our listening audience. 
Gyroscope Productions can be reached at JJT at TrueTunes.com or P.O. Box 60401, Nashville, Tennessee, 37206. Until next time, this is JJT reminding you that when you get through this place, it's just a reception room. You hang your hat up, you pull your coat off in the lobby. Peace. My center friends love to hear me sing just as good as my as my Christian friends does. And I don't make a better difference than my center friends. They help me put up my tent. They help me in my revival. Center friends comes to my church. I want sinners to come to my church. I love the sinners. In fact, to the benefits, that's the ones I'm after. And that's what Jesus was after. And I love the sinners, and they know I love them, and they follow me around with that old tent and hang around with me just like they would their grandmother, their grandfather. And they stay right there all during that revival, and sometimes some of them get saved. And if they don't get saved, then probably they will when they start growing older and think about Howard Fenster and the old tent revivals.